for the invitation to speak here. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Uh, so today I'm talking about random walk on dynamical percolation, and this is uh, based on joint work with Yuval Perez, who is uh, at Microsoft in the US, and Jeff Steif, who is in, um, in Sweden. So uh, before I define the model, I will just introduce uh, some models that probably most of you uh, already know, but I just want to fix notation. Uh, so let me first start by describing what I mean by bond percolation on ZD. So bond percolation means that I keep every edge of the integer lattice with probability p, and with probability 1 minus p, I don't keep it. And if I keep an edge, then I call it open, and if I don't keep it, I call it closed. So every edge E is open with probability P. And close with probability 1 minus P. And we do this procedure uh, independently for different edges of the lattice. So, the first question uh, we want to ask is, does there exist an infinite component of vertices that are connected to zero via an open path of edges? So let me state the theorem of broadband and Hammersley. From 57. So what they showed is that if the dimension D is greater than or equal to two, then there exists a critical parameter PC, which I will denote PC of D or PC of ZD, which is strictly between zero and one, so it's non-trivial, with the property that if I write theta of P denotes the probability. So here C of zero is the cluster of zero, which is all of the vertices that are connected to zero by an open path of edges, um, and uh, when I do this procedure here with probability p. So what they showed is that uh, when p is bigger than this critical parameter, then this probability is positive, and it's equal to zero below pc. And then the question is what happens when p is greater than pc? We know that with positive probability, zero has, is in an infinite cluster. Uh, but what Eisenman, Kesten, and Newman showed is that above the critical probability, So by using Karkodicity arguments, one can show that there is always an infinite cluster above PC. Uh, but what they showed is that this infinite cluster is actually unique. There exists a unique infinite cluster. So today in my talk, um, I'm going to talk about random walk and dynamical percolation, and everything is going to take place on the discrete torus. Zn to the d, so let me just restrict everything now to the torus. So consider the discrete torus. So it just um, uh, the d-dimensional um, torus of side length n. So you just think of like the the box with integer points where you have glued the boundaries. So we consider that, and now we restrict percolation to, this, uh, to the torus. So every edge is kept with probability p and not with probability 1 minus p. Now, if p is above the critical probability, then there exists a giant component, which I will denote by g, and which has size 
of order n to the d, and this happens with high probability. And moreover, all other clusters have size which is some power of log with high probability to some alpha with high probability. Okay, um, so what I'm going to be interested in is mixing times for random walk. So let me define uh, what I mean by mixing time. So if we have X, a Markov chain, which is irreducible and takes values in a finite state space and has transition matrix P and invariant distribution pi, then we know that as time goes to infinity, suppose that it's also aperiodic. So you know that as time goes to infinity, the distribution of X is going to converge to the invariant, to the equilibrium distribution. So what the mixing time tells us is how long we should wait for until the Markov chain is close enough to the invariant distribution. And uh, when I say close enough, we have to determine the distance. So the distance that I will be using is the total variation distance. So T mix of epsilon is the first time T so that So here I have the total variation distance between the measure which is the transition probability after t steps when you start from x uh, from pi and I'm going to take the worst starting point so I have to take the maximum overall starting state. So this is uh, the mixing time and a canonical choice for epsilon is usually to take epsilon equal to a quarter simply because after a quarter, uh, basically after anything strictly less than a half, the total variation distance decays exponentially fast. So if you know that, then you just multiply by a log of one over epsilon and you get any precision. Okay, so now let me go back uh, to, to the percolation model. So now um, I said that when we are above criticality, we have a giant component which has size of order the size of the toes. Um, with high probability. So now it makes sense we can put a random walk on this cluster and we can ask what is uh, the mixing time for the random walk on, on G. So let X be a simple random walk on G. Now this is a theorem and I will state uh, who proved it in a second. So the mixing time for this random walk is up to constants n squared with high probability. So when I write this symbol, I just mean universal constants that do not depend on n. So, and the high probability here are, refers to the environment process. So with high probability over the random graph, uh, the mixing time of the random walk mixes, reaches equilibrium in time n squared, both upper and lower bounds. So let me just um, give references. So this was proved by Benjamini and Mosel in the case d equal to two. Then it was proved by Mathieu, Pierre Mathieu and Remy for all d greater than or equal to three. And Gabor Pete gave an alternative proof which works for all d and it uses the supermetric profile and I'll come back to that uh, later in my talk. Okay, um, so, and let me also mention the results of Martin Barlow who has obtained very precise heat kernel estimates for both for random walk on the giant cluster and also on the infinite component uh, when we consider a random walk on the infinite cluster of bond percolation in Zepi. So, so far, everything I've been talking about um, is um, model static situations. So it makes sense uh, to introduce dynamics to the process. So this um, 
leads us to the model of dynamical percolation. Uh, so let me first explain what I mean by dynamical percolation. So this is a model which was introduced by Ole Hackstrom, Yuval Perez and Jeff Steiff in 97. So what is the model? So we assign IID Poisson one clocks to the edges of, of ZD. You don't have to do it for ZD, you can do it for any graph, but let's just uh, discuss about ZD. Now, when the clock, so every edge has an independent Poisson process of parameter one, and whenever the clock of an edge rings, then the edge updates its status to either open or close with probability p or one minus p, and this happens independently of whatever happened before. So, when So we have a Poisson process which uh, keeps, so every edge has a Poisson process and whenever the, the process has a point then the edge updates its status to open with probability p and closed with probability 1 minus p independently of everything else. So independently of what it was before and the states of all of the other edges. Okay, so this is uh, the model of dynamical percolation. Uh, so in this first paper where it was introduced, as I said before, they, you can define the same model for any graph, exactly the same, um, the same definition. Um, and so what they proved is that if P, the percolation probability, if P is not equal to PC, then there are no exceptional times. And what I mean by that is that if P is above PC, then we know by the theorem I stated earlier that there is a unique infinite cluster. So what they showed is that for P greater than PC, for all times, uh, there is always a unique infinite cluster with probability one. And uh, when P is below PC, then uh, again with probability one, there is never an infinite cluster. So away from criticality, so for all p not equal to pc, there are no exceptional times. And exceptional in the sense that I just explained. Um, but the story is different when p is equal to pc. Um, and this, is, um, this has been studied in the case uh, of z2. So for p equal to pc of z2, which is actually equal to a half, then there are exceptional times at which the cluster is infinite. And this was proved by Garbon, Pet and Schramm, building on earlier work of Steiff uh, Schramm and Steiff, uh, who looked at the hexagonal lattice. Okay, so, so now that I defined dynamical percolation, I can finally define the model that I'm interested in. Uh, so this is a model which was introduced a few years ago by Perez, Stauffer and Steiff. So this is random walk on dynamical percolation. So again, we are on the discrete torus, z n to the d, and we are going to assign iid 
uh, exponential mu. So mu is going to be a parameter now, and mu is going to depend on n. And actually, we are going to be interested in the regime when mu goes to zero as n goes to infinity. I will explain why uh, this is the natural thing. So assign iid exponential mu clocks to the edges. And when the clock rings, the edge updates to open or close, just like before. And now I'm going to place a random walk on the torus. So x is going to be a continuous time random walk. So the rate of the walk is 1. And so the walk is going to move as follows. Um, whenever the walk x is at a vertex, uh, he waits there for an exponential amount of time of parameter 1. And when the clock rings, the walk chooses one of the 2D neighbors and attempts to jump there and only jumps if the edge is present. Otherwise, he stays in place. So, when clock of walk rings, um, x a neighbor among the 2D neighbors uniformly at random and only jumps there if edge is present. Otherwise, it stays in place. So the reason uh, we are assigning the exponential clocks to the edges is because in this way, the invariant distribution for the walk is always the uniform distribution on the torus. So let me denote by xt and eta t the state of the system at time t. So xt is the position of the walk, which is a point in the torus. And eta t is a vector of zeros and ones. And this is the set of edges. So zero stands for closed and one stands for open. So eta t is the um, state of the edges and x is the location of the walk. Um, so x together with eta is a Markov process. But notice that uh, x on its own, of course, is not Markovian. And as I said, uh, because of the way that x jumps, because we have assigned the clocks to the edges, um, the invariant distribution for x comma eta is the product of the, invariant, of the uniform distribution on the torus times uh, the Bernoulli distribution for the edges. So pi equal to 1 over n to the d is invariant for x. Um, so, and so the only parameter here is, the only two parameters are mu, the rate of the edges, and the probability p of updating, um, of becoming open. So, so first of all, uh, let me, uh, as I said before, I'm going to take mu. So mu, we are going to take it to be much smaller than one. And actually the interesting case is when mu goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Uh, so what is the reason for that? So first of all, from an application's point of view, of, uh, an application point of view um, if mu is of the same order as the rate of the walk, then the environment updates um, at the same rate or even faster than the walk. So it's not that interesting to study. And actually, in the paper um, of um, per Stafford and Stive, where this model was introduced, what they showed is that for all, if you consider the same process, but on the whole of ZD, then for all values of mu and all values of the probability P, um, the walk has the same transits and recurrence properties, just like simple random walk on ZD. So uh, the two are very similar, so this is why we want to take mu uh, to be much smaller than one. So this paper where the model was introduced, uh, they focused, focus on the case oops, when P is less than PC. Okay, 
So, and as I said, um, what um, we are interested in studying is mixing times of the walk. Uh, so what they were able to prove, in, let me state it here, in this case, in this paper, I call it PSS, is that if you look, so as I said, x comma eta is a mark of process, we can talk about the mixing time. Uh, so what they showed is that the mixing time of x comma eta is up to constants n squared over mu, when p is less than pc. So again, this means that there exists universal constants c1 and c2, which do not depend on n, so that mixing time is upper bound by C1 times that and lower bound by C2 times the same quantity. So what this theorem is saying is that on the time scale of 1 over mu, which is the time scale of the edges, the walk mixes in time n squared, which is the same as the mixing time for a similar random walk on the torus. So in particular, um, another consequence of, one consequence of this result is that if you're waiting for the walk to exit a ball of radius r, this is going to take time r squared over mu. Yes, um, right, so it depends on, it could depend on d as well, that's right, but uh, the main thing is that it depends on n. So this is for any mu which depends on n in any way. So mu could be like e to the n, e to the minus n, whatever you like. Okay. So let me just say uh, a few words about um, the proof of this theorem. Uh, so I won't go into details because I don't have a lot of time. So for the upper bound, they use coupling. So this is a standard method of proving upper bounds for mixing times. You start to process from two different states and you want to find the coupling so that they meet as quickly as possible. Um, and the lower bound was done using uh, what is called Markov type property of metric spaces. So what I want to emphasize is that uh, the upper bound, which is using coupling, um, depends crucially on the fact that P is less than PC. So um, the open question was, what can we say when P is greater than PC? So the proof of the upper bound uh, doesn't carry to the supercritical case, because the main idea here is that in the subcritical regime, you have small clusters um, and the walk gets, uh, stays in a cluster and this allows enough time for everything outside to, so that the walk loses information about everything outside and so then between these times that the walk, two walks exit the clusters, it basically boils down to coupling two walks on, on the torus. So this is why, so of course this is um, not such a simple argument to prove but this is the main idea. Uh, but this is, um, of course, this of course doesn't work when P is greater than PC because in this case we have a giant cluster. Uh, however, the lower bound, uh, the proof of the lower bound also works in the supercritical case. So when P is greater than PC, they were able to show a lower bound of n squared plus one over mu. So. <coughs> always all of these things I'm stating, they're always up to constants. So what I mean here is that, um, so first of all, you need time one over mu for the environment to become supercritical. Um, and then you need time, so intuitively you need time n squared to mix in the giant, but uh, the, this is just for the static case, that's not the proof in this case because everything is changing, but using Markov types, so looking how long it takes for the walk to exit a ball, they were able to show this lower bound. And then the open question was, what happens, um, can we get an upper bound of the same order? So open question. And another question is, can we say anything uh, which, which holds with high probability over the environment? 
So what do I mean by that? Uh, so I defined the process x, eta. I said that x on its own is not a Markov process. However, if I condition on the environment process for all times t, then this is going to, so if I know how the environment evolves, this is going to give me a time inhomogeneous Markov chain. So if I fix eta, which is eta of t, t greater than or equal to zero, so I fix the environment for all times, then we get a time inhomogeneous Markov chain. And so we can talk about the mixing time of this time because uh, the invariant distribution is always equal to 1 over n to the d by the choice of, by assigning the clocks to the edges. So we can talk again about the mixing time of this time in homogeneous Markov chain, which is how long it takes until it reaches the uniform distribution on the torus. So that I call, I will write T mix of eta when we have fixed the environment eta. So our first theorem, so Perez, So what we were able to show is that when theta of p is greater than a half, so, so theta of p is the probability that um, the cluster of zero is infinite, uh, which is also the proportion of points that are in the giant cluster in the torus. So when theta of p is bigger than a half, we were able to show that uh, with high probability over the environment eta, the mixing time is at most what the lower bound was, but we only were able to prove that up to polylogarithmic factors. So when theta of p is greater than a half, then the probability over the environments, so that the mixing time times some polylog, some power of log n is 1 minus little of 1. This is as n goes to infinity. So this is true for any mu. Again, mu depends on n. Um, so what this is saying is that, um, so in particular, the mixing time of the full process, x, eta, in the case when theta of p is greater than a half, is upper bounded by the lower bound multiplied by logarithmic factors. Um, and, and also, we were able to show that if theta of p is strictly positive, then um, we have a similar statement, but instead of looking at the chain at a deterministic time, we're able to construct a stopping time at which time the chain is close to pi, and the expectation of this time is upper bounded by the same quantity. So, similar, but for a stopping time. So in particular, both of these two results, they imply that if we want to know how long it takes for the walk to exit a ball of radius r, then from the lower bound, we know that this is at least r squared plus 1 over mu. And from here, we get that it's also at most r squared plus 1 over mu times some polylogarithmic factors in r. So exit time from a ball is at most, from a ball BR is at most R squared plus one over mu times some polylogarithmic in R. Okay, so now I think I have 15 more minutes. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, so in the remaining time, um, I would like to explain uh, the main ideas behind the proof. No, 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 sorry, sorry, I just put two dots. So the measure of all of the environments for which the mixing time is at most the quantity that I wrote, uh, so with high probability over the environments, uh, the mixing time, the quenched mixing time is at most this quantity. So, okay, so I didn't write it here, but so I'll just um, explain. Sorry? 
Okay, so, so um, if I fix the environment process for all times, so I know exactly how the environment is going to evolve, then this gives rise to a time inhomogeneous Markov chain. So at every time, uh, it depends on the current environment, the transition matrix. So it's a time, so it is Markovian now, if we know the whole environment process. Um, and because I have assigned the clocks to the edges of the torus, uh, that's how, so the invariant distribution for X is always one over N to the D. So this is true for any environment because of the way that X jumps. Um, so what this means is that, uh, so I can just define T mix of eta for the given environment to be the first time that the total variation distance when I have fixed the environment. So I just get now a time inhomogeneous Markov chain and I look at it at time t minus the uniform. I want that to be small. But if you don't want to think about it in this way, you can just think the mixing time of the full process is also upper bounded by that. But this thing is something stronger that uh, for most environments, if I fix the environment and I look at the time in homogeneous Markov chain, then the mixing time is upper bounded by this quantity. Um. Okay, uh, so let me, um, I'll just uh, say a few words about the proof. Um, so first, let me give you a quick background on evolving sets. So evolving sets uh, was a method which was introduced by Ben Morris and Yuval Perez in 2004. And um, so this uh, was introduced. The goal was uh, to bound a uniform mixing time. So what I mean by uniform, I define the mixing time in terms of the total variation distance. So one could replace the total variation distance by the L infinity distance. Um, so their goal was to bound L infinity mixing times using isoperimetry. So let me define uh, the process. Suppose we have X, which is a Markov chain, irreducible with transition matrix P and invariant distribution pi. Um, then if X0 starts from X, then we set the evolving set process to start from X. And now I'm just going to define the next step. So if I have defined Sn, then I define Sn plus one to be all wise so that the sum of pi of x pxy is bigger than pi of y un plus 1, where the ui's are iid uniform random variables on 0, 1. So uh, let me explain what I mean here. So suppose that the invariant distribution is just uniform, just like in our case. Um, then I include a point y with probability which is proportional to the number of neighbors that Y has in the current set, in the current set SN. So in particular, if, as an example, if X is a simple random walk on the box, and at some point the evolving set looks something like that, then at the next time step, every point in the interior will keep being, will keep being in the set, and the only difference is that the set, oops, the set will increase or will gain or lose points along the boundary. So at every step, the evolving set only changes along its boundary. Um, okay, so this is uh, the evolving set process. Uh, of course, now you can't see any connection to mixing, um, but um, what is easy to check, just from the definition, is that pi of Sn is a martingale process. And also what is immediate from the definition is that uh, this evolving set process, uh, first of all, it is a Markovian process. And secondly, it can get absorbed either at the empty set or the full set. Um, so if I condition uh, the evolving set process to be absorbed to the full set, then uh, this is going to give me another Markov process, which is the dupe transform of the original. So condition, 
SM. So let's say that we are on the torus, just like we're going to be in a second. So if we condition to be absorbed to the whole torus, this gives the Duke transform that I'm going to call S tilde. So S tilde uh, is the evolving set process conditioned to hit the whole set before collapsing to nothing. Um, and as I said, pi of Sn is a martingale. Uh, and now, because we conditioned it to get absorbed, pi of Sn tilde is a sub martingale. OK, so now let me explain the connection to mixing times. So this construction is very closely related to what Daikonis and Phil call strong stationary duality. Um, and so let me just write it, strong stationary duality. And so what Daikonis and Phil showed is that there exists a coupling So this is uh, sometime in the 90s. So what they showed is that there exists a coupling of the walk and the dupe transform, S tilde, um, with the property that, so they both start from the same point, from the point X. And the coupling has a property that at every time t, even if you condition on the full dupe transform up to the present time, the walk is uniform on the dupe transform at time t. So let me just write it. There exists a coupling of x and s tilde with x0 equal x and s0 tilde equal to the singleton such that the probability that xt is equal to w given the full past So given the full past of the evolving set of the dupe transform up to time t, x has distribution pi restricted to s tilde. So, so what this is saying is that how can we use that now to prove bounds on mixing? So suppose that we had the time t, at which time the measure of the, of the dupe transform is large. So suppose there exists t at which pi of s tilde is say bigger than a half plus delta. Then at this time we know from the coupling that xt is uniform on, on s tilde. So we know that xt is uniform on a set with big measure, with strictly bigger than a half. So this is saying that at this time the total variation distance from equilibrium is going to be strictly smaller than a half less than a half minus delta. So the total variation distance from pi is going to be less than a half minus delta. And as I said before, once we draw below a half, then mixing happens very quickly. Um, so, so the question is, can we find the time t at which time the evolving set has large measure? Um, and as I said before, the, the Duke transform um, which is the original process condition to get absorbed to the full set. Uh, so pi of s tilde is a sub martingale. So we know that it increases, um, the size of pi of s tilde increases as time goes on. But um, the question we would like to understand is by how much it increases in every step. So pi of s tilde increases an expectation, of course, because it's some Bartingale, but we want to have good control on how much it increases on the drift. And this is where one needs to use the isoperimetry. So uh, what one needs to understand is what is the boundary of a set in this changing percolation process. Um, and this is um, a theorem 
So I guess let me just write it here. So uh, a similar statement has also appeared in the paper of Mathieu and Remy, um, but um, the exact uh, rate of convergence that we need, uh, we took it from Gabor's pet uh, um, paper. Uh, so what he showed is that when we are above criticality, then the probability that for all S subsets of the giant, if the size of the set S is bigger than some power of log and upper bounded by half the giant, um, then the boundary of the set is at least the size of the set to the power 1 minus 1 over d with high probability. So what this is saying is that if we look at, so let me also add here as needs to be connected. So what this is saying is that um, the isoperimetric profile of the giant cluster is the same as the profile of the lattice. So for any set which has some substantial size. Um, so we would like to use this result in order to, to be able to control the boundary of the evolving set in our case. But the main issue that we have is that in this theorem, of course, in order to control this boundary, we require S to be a subset of the giant. And in our case, there is no reason for the evolving set to be a subset of the giant. Um, and as I will show you in the simulation, I, I'll just turn it on now. Um, so it will take me. Ah, okay, so I'll just continue for a second. Um, so, um, as you will see in the simulation, um, the volume set is not always a subset of the giant. Um, but actually, we don't need that. We would just need the evolving set to have size approximately the size of the intersection of the volume set with the giant. And as you will see, this, this is not the case for all times, but um, all of our work goes into proving that we have this equality uh, for most times t. So the main step <coughs> prove the above for a lot of times t. And once we can prove that, then along these good times that we have this equivalence or even up to polylog factors, um, we have a very good control on, on the boundary of the class of the, the evolving set. And so we can show that uh, the evolving set uh, becomes like one minus delta of the giant uh, in time n squared plus one over mu times some polylog. Um, and and so let me just go back to the theorem I stated before. So when theta of p is bigger than a half, uh, so what this is saying is that uh, when the evolving set has covered most of the giant, if theta of p is bigger than a half, then the giant has size strictly bigger than a half times n to the d. And so this is saying that the random walk is uniform on a set with a invariant measure at least a half n to the d, which means that it is close to uniformity. Uh, so this is how we can prove it in the case when theta of p is bigger than a half. Uh, in the case when theta of p is strictly positive, uh, we can construct a stopping time at which time we are uh, close to pi. So let me uh, finish my talk by showing you a simulation. Uh, oops. So um, this simulation was generated by Jason Miller. Uh, who is from Cambridge. And so uh, the red dot is the random walk. Uh, we started with everything closed. So the giant every time is the green part, which is quite small at the beginning. Uh, and then the component of the walk is red. When it intersects with the giant, it becomes all green. And the black part is the evolving set. So we need to wait for a tiny bit just for everything to become super critical. And now you see that the evolving set is the black. You will see there are times now where the black part becomes some part of the giant or even most of it, but there are other times which is completely disconnected.
So here uh, the probability we use was uh, 0 0.51, so this is uh, close to being critical. And I'll stop here.